In next year's state budget process, one of the big questions for state lawmakers and Governor Kathy Hochul is the level of investment New York will make in primary prevention efforts, programs designed to address child abuse and neglect before they ever occur. Saving families from pain and suffering while also potentially saving the state in long-term costs. To discuss the current state of primary prevention programs and the direction the state could or should go in, we're joined on the Capitol Press Room by Assembly Children and Families Committee Chair Andrew Hevesy, a Queens Democrat who recently held a hearing to examine this issue. Welcome back to the show, Assemblymember. Thank you, Dave. Good to, good to talk to you. Well, traditionally, how has the state divided its time and resources when it comes to preventing abuse and neglect as opposed to addressing the the fallout downstream of the product of abuse and neglect? So that's a great question. Um, The the answer is New York State has historically been investing um, after uh, uh, children have been involved in the child welfare system or the juvenile justice system or after they've been uh, traumatized. Um, So the goal for us this year Uh, is to redirect uh, as uh, much funds as uh, we possibly can into truly preventing uh, adverse childhood uh, experiences and uh, and childhood trauma in order to prevent and truly prevent some of the worst societal problems that we have, including uh, rising rates of crime, homelessness, uh, individuals uh, on public assistance in perpetuity. Uh, so I am a firm believer that if you were able to prevent uh, childhood trauma and or mitigate the effects of kids who have been traumatized, it will go an incredibly long way to preventing our greatest problems that we're dealing with uh, in New York today. You use the word redirect. So does that mean you want to take funding that goes to kids who are downstream, so to speak, who are getting support because they've gone through abuse and neglect and taking those dollars and moving them towards primary prevention? Or do you want to move money from elsewhere towards primary prevention? Because if it's coming from the former, those kids who are already in the welfare system, it seems like they're kind of out of luck then. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So I certainly did not mean to take any money away from existing programs. Um, I have been with my colleagues in the legislature on the front lines of fighting against cuts, particularly uh, from the prior governor who every year put forward an executive budget where he was looking to cut those funds to those kids. So I will absolutely not be looking to redirect funds from there. But I would argue that um, if there's not new revenue generated in this coming budget, that there are other parts of the state budget that I think the redirecting of funds into preventing problems as opposed to putting on uh, the best band-aids we can after the damage has been done. That's something I would certainly be open to. But just to be clear, um, I don't want to take any money away from any of those existing programs. Some of the programs that are um, considered uh, secondary or tertiary prevention are crucially important for the kids and their families who are involved in the uh, child welfare system and the uh, juvenile justice system, um, there needs to be an increase in funds there as well. Um, But I do want to make the point that we have not gotten into the business, New York State has not gotten into the business of preventing these problems before they start. And that's where I think uh, the future of public policy in this area lies. When we speak with officials in the Hochul administration about the issue of primary prevention, one of the things they repeatedly focus on is their efforts to get more flexibility with how they can spend federal dollars. Is that a real opportunity in in terms of targeting money toward primary prevention? Or are we putting too much emphasis in our ability to better maximize existing resources? It's a good question. And so for the Hochul administration, I think they're they're saying what you're um, uh, what we're supposed to be hearing, which is the federal government does have a limitation, particularly on its Title four E funds through the Family First Prevention Act that Congress passed. The biggest uh, problem is they are requiring that any program that gets funded with that federal money be evidence based. And the prevention services that I am talking about and my colleagues are talking about in the state are not covered. So when the Hochul administration and my friend Sheila Poole, uh, who I am said to to hear is moving on uh, to to greener pastures, 
um, but she's been talking about for a while is uh, that we uh, advocate together to make sure that the federal money does become more flexible because there are programs that could use that federal funding. However, that's not where our focus should lie. Our focus should lie on state funds, new state money uh, that should be coming uh, into communities, particularly uh, communities with high rates of uh, child protective services cases and others to try to prevent those uh, bad occurrences from happening in the first place. For listeners just joining us, so you're listening to the Capitol Press Room, and we're speaking with Assembly Children and Families Committee Chair Andrew Hevesy, a Queens Democrat. One of the programs that got highlighted by uh, Office of Children and Family Services Commissioner Sheila Poole was this Helping Hands uh, initiative that essentially serves as connecting families in crisis with volunteer families to serve as, I guess, short-term supervisors of kids where parents can no longer care for them, at least temporarily. What do you think of this program? Is this something that the state should be investing resources in, in terms of its time and energy? So, so the answer is yes, um, but that's what I would consider a secondary prevention effort. That means that you already have a family in crisis uh, and that you already have a family potentially involved with child protective services. So what I'm focused on is trying to get money into communities to uh, prevent uh, specifically cases being brought with families, particularly for neglect, which are actually uh, poverty-related cases. So um, we see a lot of families and children caught up in the, in the child welfare system for uh, being poor. Uh, it's not that they're bad parents or they're neglectful. Uh, it's sometimes they don't have the resources to care for their kids in the way that we believe is appropriate. But instead of the state coming in and helping these families and kids, they come in with uh, pointing a finger saying, you're not a good parent and you have a, a neglect case put on you, uh, which um, the consequences of that for the kid and the family are numerous and they're all bad. Um, so the Helping Hands program, I'm sure it's a very good program, but that's not the focus that the assembly will be taking this coming year. We're going to try to get money to kids before they even have contact with the government or child protective services. During your October hearing, your Republican colleague, John Salka, raised the issue of differing outcomes for families that have a single family head of household versus families with two parents. And in light of that and the different outcomes that they state sees in single family versus two parent family homes. Does primary prevention at the state level include some sort of initiative to ensure that kids are being raised by two parents or is that not the state's business? I don't believe that's the state's business. I believe great families come in all different shapes and sizes, whether it's a single mom or dad or uh, you're both parents or um, any other iteration of a family. I don't think the state should be involved in trying to pick uh, winners or, or try to uh, facilitate one type of family over the other. I don't think that's the state business. However, um, I do believe that the state really needs to get involved with helping the existing families weather some difficult circumstances that uh, we're seeing these days in the last couple of years that many parents have not had to, had to deal with, including uh, COVID pandemic, um, higher rates of uh, childhood trauma due to the government response to that pandemic, and a variety of other factors. So whatever the family makeup is, we need to get um, resources into those families before they get involved with the uh, Child Protective Services. So based on your hearing, as you think about the upcoming budget process, what are some primary prevention initiatives that aren't being funded or maybe are being funded in a limited basis for maybe a limited geographical region or for a limited number of people that you think should get investments uh, in the adopted budget next year? That's a great question. So when I think of primary prevention, there's a variety of pro programs that do that. And we actually invested in one last year to a small degree. But what I'm, what I'm focused on now are called family enrichment centers. And they are now, there are three, I want to get the numbers right, there are three in New York City. We uh, in my office have visited two, and we're going to be setting up actually a tour uh, for the rest of my colleagues in the state over the next couple of weeks. The city of New York has been great about facilitating the three that we have, and they're also going to be ramping up the number of FECs, family enrichment centers they have in New York City to, I believe, add nine more in different areas throughout the state. But New York State has not gotten into the business of a 
uh, using this type of model, a family enrichment center, which basically provides a safe space in neighborhoods where sometimes it's not so safe for parents and kids to come and drive what the family enrichment center does. This is not government coming in and saying, hey, you need this service. Uh, you need to do this. Um, you need health care for your kid. They are on the ground opportunities for families and parents to come together and decide what they need on their own. Uh, and the results have been fantastic. And I believe that will be the future of primary prevention among other programs that we know uh, work as well. Well, finally, if we do see significant investments in primary prevention in next year's budget and maybe in a continued level in future budgets, when should we expect to see results? When do we get to see that transition of kids who are avoiding these negative outcomes? How, how fast could it happen? So it's a great question, um, sort of an existential question, but l- let me start with where we were from last year's budget. So we have uh, a responsibility to jump off of um, uh, the first step we took last year, which was a, a, the largest single investment in uh, kids in New York State. Uh, we focused our money on child care because that does prevent and mitigate the effects of childhood trauma. But we did not um, uh, last year invest in kids who were um, likely to become involved with the uh, child protective services and the child welfare system. And that's the second step that we have to take this year. Um, So I believe the robust investment is required. Your specific question about when do you see results, the results you will see in declining rates over the next couple of years, I believe, uh, of kids um, uh, entering the child protective services. Um, So there will be uh, that evidence will um, come to fruition, but it will take a couple of years. So, you know, my colleagues talk about about preventing crime or preventing homelessness or preventing this or that, I am of the belief that primary prevention is the only true way to get there. And once you actually start putting dollars behind this, and I think this is the future of policy in the child welfare space, um, you will see dramatic reductions in the number of kids who are even touching the system. And when you see that, that is a societal win of epic proportions, because those kids are going to be exponentially more likely to have success in life and not to be doomed or defined by the trauma that we are uh, so unfortunately seeing many kids and families um, have to deal with these days. Well, we've been speaking with Assembly Children and Families Committee Chair Andrew Hevesy. He is a Queens Democrat. Assembly member, thank you so much for making the time. I really appreciate it. I appreciate it, Dave. Thank you so much. Take care. Support for the Capitol Press Room is provided by New York State United Teachers, a union of professionals in education, human services, and health care.